I'll start just quick. I mean, I think, well, we have started to see, I think, I think believe Hulu announced they were profitable in the US. So um, that's the first step, and that was ad-funded only. But that they're also looking to, as I remember, to move to a payment mechanic as well. Um, so clearly, it seems to be easier in film where there is so much data versus music. But obviously, what happens when we have 100 megabit lines to the home, that, that barrier um, goes away. Um, so I think it does, it, it does shift a bit, but you, you, you're, you're making money for entertainment. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll just highlight two dimensions to entertainment that are uh, very valuable on these two platforms. One is the blockbuster titles, and two is the celebrity value, the aspirational celebrity value. And uh, what we're seeing now is sort of a trend of back to the future. Uh, on platforms like Facebook, there was a window where anyone could release a game and could get very big very fast. But now the environment is so cluttered that you need big entertainment brands to cut through. One of the prime motivations for the Electronic Arts Playfish uh, acquisition uh, was the brands that uh, Playfish can now tap into from the Electronic Arts portfolio. These are big brands, in some cases even uh, movie titles, that they can then uh, adapt for Facebook to create branded applications. Uh, the other aspect of this is, uh, is the celebrity value. And in any successful application, especially in the gaming space, um, it's interesting for people, say, to win money, but it's even more powerful if you can tap into some ability for users to attain some kind of aspirational value right at the top of their psychological motivation. So you're seeing companies like, uh, in the gaming space, a company called Maca, which has recently acquired the rights to Britain's Got Talent. And one aspect of that game is that uh, you can play the game, but as a special bonus, you can appear in the TV audience. So that's one step closer to that aspirational value that can really motivate players to come and pay and you can use the blockbuster content to acquire them cheaply. I, mean, I think it's interesting so it's on that. I, mean, I think it's also interesting that if you look at Zynga, which is obviously the big social gaming, that's I think got a valuation now rumored to be about $5 billion or something, um, and it's very dependent on the platform again. It's that dependency on the platform that I'm very interested in. It, and they're very dependent on the Facebook platform. And there were rumors, I don't know whether they've been confirmed, that they were going to launch Z Zed Live or Zynga Live and basically launch their own social network because they had to get off that dependency on Facebook, because otherwise the risk is all their profits would go to Facebook. It's a similar risk that one can view Google as a tax on e-commerce in, in one sense, because at some point you can bid up to marginal cost of profitability, um, but you can bid up to, in some categories, like I saw in hotels, people start to bid up to lifetime value of the hotel on Google. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see where that equation goes in content. They've stopped. <laughs> The, the answer is people work out pretty quickly Web what the lifetime yeah. value of their customer is, and yeah. then they stop. So. Yeah, and then they go to that um, point, and then everybody goes, that's an arms race. Yeah. yeah. Um, and some interesting things happened, actually, with uh, when the recession first hit, all the big companies cut their search spend, and, the, and so a lot of the small companies um, you know, got, mm -hmm. got into the auction because they didn't cut their spend because they were mm -hmm. focused on business growth, and as long as they were still mm -hmm. making out of the money out of the customer, they kept it on. Um, so we obviously own YouTube, um, and so we believe that it will be mainly an ads model. Uh, I think the industry at the moment is like in this tough place where they can't quite make up their mind, the entertainment industry, whether they want to put their content onto the internet platforms. The reality is um, consumers expect it to be there. So when we look at YouTube searches, um, the, they, they do search for all the big TV programs, films, et cetera, et cetera. So the smart publishers embrace it. They use um, video ID technology, for instance, to claim all the clips of their, pro of their program that they put. They, they, you can claim the clips that other people of your program put up onto YouTube. Um, and I think if you don't do it, then, then that's when the piracy happens, whereas the programs that you put on yourself, then you have the control and you get the ad revenue from it. That the ad revenue is still small, um, but it's growing, growing very fast. And it partly will depend on how we work out the ad formats, because we're still experimenting. You know, is pre-roll the right format? How long can the pre-roll be? What are people willing to, um, willing to um, see as an ad? Um, generally, consumers are more positive than we worried about, about um, watching the ads. So they totally understand the trade-off. You know, if they want to watch a movie on YouTube, there will be ads on it. Um, yeah. If, if you think about that, you know, looking at that, if you, an ad model tends to favor people who are, you know, would naturally go and expect it free. Um, as you go up the income scale, people are not just willing to pay, they're willing to pay a lot. And I think what you need to do is decide what it is they're paying for. Uh, fractional purchases, I think increasingly, 
it will be both ad and revenue based based on how much you watch the times you watch it. So you're going to see different ways of incremental payments. Because I think the problem with the music industry was everybody will agree that it was pretty much robbing the customer. So really what's happening now is the customer is saying the first generation fight back, the second generation create the new market mechanisms, and the third generation agree to pay in a different way. And I think we're now between the second and third where we know they were robbing us. Now we're going, OK, we've got stuff free. We realize there's a problem with copyright, with thievery from, you know, from people creating the actual uh, products. So let's work out a different way of payment. Fractional will certainly happen. Subscription, I think, will become more important than we think. Add subscription base. Third rate, you know, bartering or co-sponsoring or partnering, where another company says, we will provide you the portal as long as you do certain things in return for doing it. So I don't think the freemium that people talk about, this kind of free approach to the internet, will last. It is not a model. It always happens in every culture that always goes free at some point in the cycle of, of kind of, uh, you know, commodities. And I think we've been through that cycle, and now we're getting back to the cycle of recreating the payment platform. I think we'll know a lot more in a month or two when we've seen News Corp experiment with their paywall. Obviously, I'm on the board of The Guardian who have declared um, content that their content is staying free, um, as, as far as they can see. Um, I, think, uh, yeah. sorry, sorry, sorry. I think another theme um, on entertainment is the whole kind of uh, personalization of content. So I think recommendation engines are getting more and more sophisticated. They're not just saying, well, you bought the last album, recommend another mm -hmm. album. They're now starting to really develop a, a good profile for any consumer and actually operate across different types of media so they can personalize and serve you up the content that you want rather than the content that you don't want. And that's something that the internet can do very, very well. And it's something that you can't do in more traditional forms of entertainment. And I think that's a really significant trend that you'll see happening more and more. And it is worth highlighting quickly, just We7, a British success story, I think, you know, which is sort of Spotify gets a lot of the attention, but We7 is a British ad-funded music site with, a, with, with some subscription. I think it's really mainly ad-funded. And I think I, I seem to remember they announced a, a few weeks ago break-even so, um, yeah. for that model, so it, it, it can work. I think in the, in the mobile world as well, in, uh, in terms of how you can get your entertainment content out to your customers, there's a fundamental shift right now towards more stable, future-proof platforms. So you can effectively work with companies that will develop your applications for your products on two or three platforms. You have to pick your winners. Is it going to be Google? Is it going to be Microsoft? Is it going to be uh, Apple, etc.? But what is fundamental about all these platforms is they exist now. They will exist in two or three years' time. They, they are available on a range of devices. And fundamentally, you can develop something knowing that you will effectively you'll have a domino effect where uh, anybody who's been using, for instance, your product on his phone or her phone will be able to use that very same application on the next phone when you upgrade. That was very different in the past. You were really doing like a one-off development for like one phone. And that was com constantly holding back the entertainment industry. Now you can be sure that your investment is effectively future-proofed. And I think the software development kits that the big platform vendors make available to you are more solid, easy to use, less costly to develop. So I think there's, a, there's an opportunity there for the entertainment business to actually, again, pick a few winners, develop a content for, and then you can be sure that you, you reach an, a greater number of loyal customers over two or three generations of devices. I think what we haven't alluded to, some of this that will help us, is innovation in micropayment. So obviously, yeah. there's the threat is that it's all left to Apple and iTunes and Google and Google Checkout. But the opportunity is that there are many other players now working on micro content micropayment schemes, um, both for TV and for news. So it'll be interesting to see how they develop.